time we've been wanting to do something like, um, something that has to do with anarchism and black struggle. I mean, that's been like, locally, um, black struggle has been like the center of most of the really important organizing that's uh, ha been happening over the past, you know, six or so years that I've lived here, and I'm sure longer than that. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, just uh, like through my own introduction into anarchism, it wasn't like, like the very first anarchist conference I went to was organized by um, queer black women anarchists. And the very first like anarchist, like someone who I thought of as like a real anarchist revolutionary, you know, that gave a talk was, you know, Ashanti Austin, former, you know, black, uh, black Panther, um, you know, black liberation fighter of, of decades. And so sort of like my uh, understanding of anarchism was not like this white sort of subculture notion, you know, petty bourgeois, you know, uh, white boy kind of, you know, stuff that people say anarchism is. It was, you know, people who are really like, uh, there was a lot of black and brown people who were, you know, dedicated to uh, revolutionary ideas. And, you know, when I would look around me at who's actually struggling, it was oftentimes it was not just people of color, but specifically black people. And yet when you see like the people writing about what is anarchism, it was always like a white academic who you've never seen in the streets next to you. And so I always felt like, you know, we need to hear the voices of the people who are actually doing uh, the organizing. Um, we're not, I feel like, you know, we're not always getting like, uh, if we're only listening to like, and I don't have a problem with like academics, I'm an academic, but if we're only listening to like academics who are sort of like right about struggle, and not listening to the people who are actually doing the organizing, then we're, we're not getting, you know, there's a lot of important lessons that we're missing. Uh, so uh, first we want to start, um, so we have a, a comrade, uh, Muhammad El Nayem, from, uh, who was uh, a journalist uh, with a background in history and sociology, and he's uh, a black internationalist uh, who's uh, uh, been, sort of covers black liberation struggles um, globally, and who was in Sudan during the uprisings, and, and is going to talk um, uh, about some of the lessons um, from a sort of a black anarchist perspective. What are the lessons of the uprisings of Sudan? What what can we get from that? Um, and uh, he was going to live stream in, but he's been traveling. He's actually so uh, it just wasn't going to work out. So yesterday he recorded. Um, this message that he wanted to just you know, specifically recorded this message for this crowd. Um, and so we're gonna uh, hear that first. Um, and he's he was in Sudan, but he's recording this from Chile, and he's just constantly traveling. So he's in Chile talking about what he learned during the uprising while he was in Sudan. So I'm gonna do that first, and then we're gonna um, introduce a panel of. Um, some of our Black Rose comrades from uh, different parts of the United States and, and hear um, some of the important uh, things that they have to say. And I'll, I'll introduce them um, after uh, after we play this message from Mohammed first. So let's do that. Hello, everybody. I'm Mohammed Al Naim. I am not uh, in Sudan right now. I was in Sudan and I was a participant in the revolution, but I'm currently uh, talking to you all from Chile. Uh, but uh, I wanted to talk about the Sudan revolution. I don't want to go too deep into the historical context, um, but I wanted to mainly go on um, how it can help people in the United States and elsewhere uh, reflect on the art of uh, revolution. But just to be brief, uh, Sudan protests began on December 13th in the peripheral city of Damazin before they reached Adbara on December 19th. Uh, and then a uh, domino effect happened where each city began to protest. Uh, they were protesting against austerity measures, which made bread prices really, really cheap. Um, I mean, really, really expensive, uh, unaffordable, ATM machines empty, um, and life miserable. But uh, it wasn't just, these were not just bread riots. They were protests against a dictatorship that had entrenched itself, a military dictatorship that had entrenched itself in Sudan for 30 years. Um, uh, the protests began in the neighborhoods. They began mainly among the youth, 
uh, but quickly the Sudanese Professionals Association came and became the leader of uh, organizing the protests, at least within the central city of Khartoum when they hit there. Uh, the Sudanese Professionals Association is actually a coalition of illegal banned unions uh, that were operating underground and preparing themselves for a time when a revolution like the one that did happen, um, happened. Uh, they, they, and they quickly gained the support of the streets. Um, and they demanded, they set up the, for, the Declaration for Freedom and Change, which was released on January 1st, demanding a complete transition to civilian rule, to, saying that the organization, that the revolution is not just against Omar al-Bashir as a dictator, but is against the whole system that's existed for 30 years, and demanding a complete transition to democratic and civilian rule. Um, the opposition parties joined in with the Sudanese Professionals Association, and together they created the forces for freedom and change. Now, within the neighborhood level, uh, neighborhoods were rising up and they were also becoming really organized uh, into neighborhood councils. And the neighborhood council movement is independent from the Sudanese Professionals Association, but until very recently has worked in tandem with the Sudanese Professionals Association and the forces for freedom and change. Now, in order to stop people from getting constantly exhausted of going out into the streets and risking arrest, risking being beaten up and being risk, risking um, being hurt. Uh, there was an ingenious decision to do a sit-in and various sit-ins across Sudan in front of the military headquarters demanding an immediate transition. They did these on April the 6th, uh, 2019, and these were done right outside the military headquarters. Um, on April 11th, Omar al-Bashir, the dictator of 30 years, was finally overthrown. And the next day, they tried to bring someone else to replace him, but because they saw him as uh, the transitional military council, the people that deposed Omar al-Bashir brought someone else. But the people didn't like him either because they said that he, his, he had blood in his hands too. Within 24 hours, the next dictator uh, in chief, uh, the dictator to be, was overthrown. Um, and then he was finally replaced with a third person. Now, the people who were responsible for doing all of this overthrowing were terrified at the fact that people were getting organized in the streets, who were terrified by the fact that general strikes were shutting down the country, and were just terrified by the fact that um, workplaces were being shut down and occupations were happening uh, in front of the military headquarters. These people were called the Transitional Military Council. Um, the forces of freedom and change have the support of the streets, and they have the support and with the money from the diaspora, people who live outside. The Transitional Military Council has the support of the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Counter-Revolutionary Egypt, all the other countries who are terrified of the transition to democracy in Sudan. They've been at a, uh, for the past few months, they have been at uh, a deadlock uh, in conversations. For freedom and change have demanded civilian rule. They're demanding some kind of rule, some kind of rule in the transitionary period, which has been agreed upon to be four years, so that they can dismantle the deep state. Then the massacre happened. This is the thing that made everyone sort of aware of what was going on in Sudan. Um, the massacre happened on June 3rd, um, and sort of immediately after that, there was a huge social media campaign. They raped people, killed them, threw bodies in the Nile. Um, and this was all done by the Transitional Military Council, which is led by the military, supposedly, not really, but actually, uh, a group called the Rapid Support Forces, which emerged out of the Janjaweed, a militia that was sponsored by the government to commit the genocide in 2003. Those people support with UAE and Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Those are the people that were responsible for the disgusting massacre that we all heard. Thankfully, on the day of the massacre, I wasn't there, but a week later, I had to go to Kenya um, with some other activists, and we continued organizing there and created the first, one of the first Pan-African declarations of Sudan. But that's on the side. The most important thing right now is the, within the occupations, the military, or the occupations outside of the military headquarters, we saw a world that we wanted to see. There was radical solidarity, there was radical democracy, there was mutual aid. All of the sort of under the most important principles of anarchism were being practiced in real life. We saw that we didn't necessarily even need the nation state. Um, to be able to find bonds of love and solidarity in, 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 in ways that don't exist even in the so-called most advanced Western capitalist societies. Now, 
I could continue talking about how amazing this revolution was, and I'm sure that I could do that a lot. Um, and I'm sure that you'd all be very interested in that. But I think what's much more important is to talk about modes of organization um, and um, how the Sudanese experience is useful. So that we move beyond the mentality that often plagues the American and European left of solidarity with those struggles over there from actually learning um, that, uh, learning from, from each other and not, you know, seeing each other as being in one struggle and the struggle for human emancipation. Now, Sudan, I think, was a very sophisticated struggle um, that hasn't gotten its due. And that I think it's still unfortunate that we always have to see ourselves in the cycle where uh, only when a tragedy happens, like the massacre on June 3rd, do people actually understand what's going on. What's happening in Sudan, I think, comes from the fact that Sudan has a rich revolutionary history. Sudan was one of the first post-colonial countries to have a revolution against against uh, its own dictators, but a revolution in 1964 against General Aboud and a revolution in 1985 against General Nimeri. Um, and for a country that's very young, it's also been the country that's had the most coup attempts. And it's the country that with only within six years or seven years since independence have we even had civilian rule. The vast majority of the time we've been under, under, under military dictatorships. Uh, but what this has meant has also been that there's been a cultivation of a strong culture of resistance. We talk about the revolution beginning in December 2018, but in reality, for the past 30 years, there's been an underground movement of people risking arrest, uh, often getting arrested, to organize and prepare for something like this to happen. Um, within Sudan, a huge vehicle for this underground movement has been the Sudanese Communist Party, which uh, with the onslaught of neoliberalism, of course, meant that it used to have its base in the workplaces, but with the factories closed down, uh, its base has changed. But it still has a strong base of support among the intelligentsia, among university students, and among um, professors and these kinds of things. I think it's these kinds of groups have a culture that I think the U.S. and many other groups, many other countries can learn from. Because I think one of the first things is, is that they genuinely believe and believed the 30 years and took the risks and got arrested in a space where you don't have liberal democracy, you know. Um, that revolution was possible. And when you, when you genuinely believe a revolution is possible, then you're willing to actually make the sacrifices that are needed to make, that are needed to make personal sacrifices, right? I think one thing that, people in the United States, uh, Europe tend to do is, all right, you have a protest against police brutality. So what do you do? You go to the police station and they give you, they write down a statement for you saying, okay, you can protest at this specific time and uh, we'll escort you. So you have this paradox where you're walking and you're marching with everyone else, marching against police brutality and you're being escorted by the police, right? It's all part of this sort of spectacle, skept yeah, spectacle of, of liberal democracy where you have, you know, people, uh, joining in and reinforcing the liberal democratic sphere so the forces in power can say, ah, you see, we allow you to protest. Uh, isn't, this, isn't this white democracy so great, right? Um, and so protests become this way of like sort of reinforcing liberal democracy. They also become sort of uh, like carnivals, you know, like, you know, you're, you can protest to, to today, you know, the police have this like sort of list of protests that are going to be happening today. and Number one, you know, is going to be the protest for the whales. And number two is going to be like the protest for against police brutality. And then, oh, number three, the fascists are going to protest against, uh, against the refugees, you know. I mean, that and, and, and nothing really happens from there, you know. You, you don't have one of the things in Sudan, for example, is you had the sacrifice of, within the universities. You have strong culture of constantly, just like the soapboxes in Harlem that you hear about in the 1920s, you had constant talks and discussions, but you also had a strong system of building a cadre base of dedicated activists who will travel across the country and spread the word uh, and, and, and entrench themselves in different neighborhoods and build neighborhood councils so that if a situation was to occur, they'd be prepared. 
people who were well known in the neighborhood, people who had received the respect from, from their neighbors. Um, but one of the problems you have in the United States is you don't know your neighbors, you know. Um, and so we can have all these deep, deep conversations about radical democracy and 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 sitting down and like uh, neighborhood councils, but if you don't know, if you live in a building and you don't know the person living right next to you and the person living right there, how is the revolution going to happen? So what you end up happen, having is you have subcultures of activist communities who, um, who tend to be like, uh, don't genuinely, genuinely, don't really believe a uh, revolution is possible. And subcultures of activist communities are like any subculture. You've got the cyberpunk subculture, you've got the otakus, and you've got the activists, you know? It's all, again, all part of the spectacle of liberal democracy. I think one of the things is, is you ha there has to be a level of seriousness of building neighborhood councils and starting from where you're at, you know? Um, and there has to be the belief that things can actually change. Um, that's something that, I mean, I, I have, believe me, when I talk about the Sudanese revolutionary class or whatever you want to call them, or intelligentsia or whatever, I am extremely critical. But these are things that I can't deny, that within the only, re the only way in which a group like the Sudanese Professionals Association could come to the fore is because of the sacrifices of people who for decades have brought down a uh, culture of resistance. And this cultural resistance, not just through the Sudanese Communist Party, but that's one of the vehicles, has allowed for them to be able to seize the moment, to develop a, a declaration, draw a roadmap for the future. And throughout that process, they've had to endure so much um, torture. You know, you don't, you don't, if you want to start a protest in Sudan, you, you can't. It's not even, you know, it's not, it's not even something like that. And I think at the end of the day, it's also one of the things that I found quite refreshing about sort of the activist culture um, was that it wasn't about like, you know, I mean, I make this complaint a lot. And to me, especially since coming back from Sudan, I've been making it a lot. It's like, it, it wasn't about the performances that you could make about your identity or, 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 you know, um, how oppressed you are or whatever. It was about like what you do. And that was the basis, that was the fundamental basis for how a person or an activist was judged, right? Um, maybe they might not speak the right lingo. Um, they, might not, um, uh, they might not be able to read the most deep texts and they don't know the biggest concepts, but these are people, person who's a revolutionary is a person who is trusted because in their community, they're able to talk to the elders and they're able to talk to children, they're able to connect with them. They're able to deal with teachers and they're able to deal with students. They're able to deal with the community in ways that they're seen as members of that community and they're able to build a neighborhood council. And they're able to find out who's starving in the community and provide some support and food for them. These are the kinds of people who are delegated authority within the neighborhood council movement. These are horizontal movements that spurred spontaneously throughout the revolutionary process. There, there are lessons there. There are lessons in building neighborhood councils. There are lessons building in, in building uh, organizations of dedicated cadres. And all of these lessons can allow for uh, a genuine, you know, throughout the process, you know, anarchism perhaps is the most important philosophy, not because people have read Kropotkin or, or, or whatever, but because in struggle and in scarcity, when things are not, there's, you don't have an abundance of things, they do anarchism in practice. And, you know, in that sense, you know, mutual aid has sort of been the motor. I think that, uh, the same could be done in, in the United States um, or in, in Europe, but it would have to be first a move away from anarchism as a subculture to anarchism as something that's genuinely concerned with building mass movement, a move away from uh, just the reading groups to actual action and building your bases of support and, uh, and being prepared for when things happen. And I think, again, another thing that's really important is also to have an international consciousness. What can you learn from Haiti, 
what can you learn from Zimbabwe? What can you learn from Sudan? You know, what are the pitfalls? What are the, what are the consequences? Reaching out to different activists, finding out what worked and what didn't work. These are all things that can, that can happen, that can allow for reinvigoration to happen. But if, if our preoccupations and our concerns are whether or not Black Panther is a Hollywood movie, if the cause of this is, 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 you know, is the revolution we've been waiting for, or, or whether the Oscars are white or not, and if our, our energy is in the wrong place, then these, these kinds of revolutionary movements and actions won't happen, you know? And how much of, how much of, how much of this kind of subcultural stuff is actually just consolation for people moving up um, up the ladder and uh, becoming the next you know, presidential candidates or business people, or whatever, you know, how much of this is a phase that you'll grow out of, you know, the, the, these are, these are questions that need to be asked. Once that gets, that spell gets broken, then I think um, we can start to see, um, uh, tangible actions that take inspiration from these different movements. And I think, you know, it's possible that maybe I am, uh, you know, uh, having a hard time adapting back to old activist spaces I'm in, but these are sort of some of the reflections that I've had. And I think that, the, that, that it's important, you know, it's important to have a base of, of activists who are dedicated and prepared for a revolution. It's important to have neighborhood councils and, to build community where there is none because capitalism destroyed those communities. I think then we can start to talk about a black anarchist vision. Um, and nothing taught me that more than my experiences in Sudan. So those are sort of some of my jumbled thoughts um, and some of the historical background and context. And I'm looking forward to hearing how the discussion goes later. Thank you. Um, so we uh, we've got uh, our comrade uh, Marvin from uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, following uh, Marvin, we're gonna have we're gonna hear from our comrade Servio from Providence. Uh, and then, uh, and then, following that, we'll hear from Amber from Miami. <laughs> and I'm going to turn the mic over to them. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Marvin. Um, uh, I guess I'll just tell something about myself. Um, I have uh, started doing organizing, uh, actual anarchist organizing, around uh, three or four years ago. Uh, starting anti-fascist uh, organizing. Um, I think one of the challenging things, and uh, as like someone, uh, as someone who's black and working in that kind of space, um, I, I started having challenging, like challenging myself, like with these questions, like what is anti-fascism, and common, I guess one of the common misconceptions, or I will call it misconceptions, like people think it's just like against neo Nazis. Um, I remember Charlottesville when that question was really critically, uh, I, I think that was like one of the critical moments where people had to like question like what is, um, like what is anti-fascism? Is it just, you know, a bunch of angry white men like marching in the street or is it something that's systemic? Um, and like we start to question like even the microtransgressions against like so-called allies who told, who try to police Black behavior, uh, radical hate behavior at Charlottesville. And um, I think even still today, even Kambola Urban uh, had like a message or a warning to the anti-fascist movement to not, not let it become another white white rights movement um, where white people, one, take center of the platform, but it only, it, it seems like it's like an adventurist and, um, some kind of uh, 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 like like game where you, you just get some kind of clout and not actual like like relief uh, or not relief but like a, a fight against like systemic oppression where you have to police ice 
um, capitalism that's extended in like communities where you know there's gentrification, there's labor, that, and, it, and all like multi uh, like like interlinks with one another. Um, but uh, that's that's one of my few uh, experiences I want to hug the mic. <laughs> Anyone else want to talk about anything? <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> We're recording a lot today. <laughs> Ongoing media. Um, so yeah, um, frankly, I haven't decided yet on what to speak on. Everybody who's part of my organization kind of knows that at this point because I'm a good manager. <laughs> um, but so, you know, I'm trying to like balance uh, whether to talk about experiences stuff or more theoretical stuff. Um, I guess I'll talk about experiences. I'm personally involved in um, the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee locally uh, in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and uh, for those who don't know, the Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee is a section of the Industrial Workers of the World. Um, IWOC, the Industrial Work, Work, Incarcerated Workers Organizing Committee, IWOC is uh, a committee dedicated to uh, a committee dedicated to supporting incarcerated people who are organizing themselves against the carceral system. Um, and also of outside uh, comrades who are also fighting against the same carceral system. Um, and uh, it, it's a challenge, um, you know, to do that, that type of work. Um, I'm myself, am not formally incarcerated, um, but uh, it's it, one of the things that brought me to that work is, you know, um, recognizing the shortcomings of the protest movement that emerged after the Ferguson uprising, right? Um, and, you know, uh, recognizing that obviously, you know, um, there's a need to develop a uh, grassroots basis of struggle um, in all areas of society. Um, within uh, Black Rose, uh, there are ongoing debates of how to interpret those different areas of society. One way that we've um, come to understand it or interpret it um, is by uh, recognizing that there are different sectors of social struggle. Um, and so, you know, uh, I've been trying to reflect again on the shortcomings of the protest movement after Ferguson and then, you know, understanding that struggle as uh, a struggle that occurs on the neighborhood level, right? Um, or rather, uh, police violence and racialization occurs on the territorial neighborhood level. Um, but at the same time, it's in, uh, inextricably connected to the prison um, as a site of domination and control, right? Um, so therefore, if we are gonna want to be able to challenge police um, in, a, in a broader sense, one, we're gonna get arrested. After we get arrested, what do we do? Um, if we find ourselves further in the carceral system, do we interpret ourselves as like not being able to organize anymore or do we continue organizing? Um, some of those things are, you know, are, are what had been running through my mind, um, you know, since 2014. And in 2015 is, you know, when I uh, learned about IWOC a little bit more and, and got involved and I mean, uh, the prison as a site of struggle um, is one that um, is extremely important or has featured prominently in uh, contemporary Black thought, um, but the topics of confinement um, have been found through all of Black th thought, um, you know, since uh, enslavement and colonization. And so, I mean, one of the things that I was, uh, you know, uh, debating whether or not to, to discuss here um, is the legacy of Martin Sostre. Um, how many of you do know who Martin Sostre is? Okay, interesting. Um, cool. So for those who don't know, Martin Sostre um, was a black Puerto Rican uh, who lived in uh, upstate New York um, in Buffalo. 
he helped uh, found the Afro Asian bookstore, which um, well was exactly that a bookstore. But beyond that, it was a record shop and a place for literature and learning for people in the neighborhood. Um, it could have been in 65 or 66, something like that. Um, the police in Buffalo had killed a young black kid um, and uh, a riot ensued um, or a protest ensued that then turned into a riot and full rebellion. One of the things that had occurred is that the police uh, targeted the Afro-Asian bookstore and framed Martin Sostre um, as the supposed, you know, orchestrator of this thing, right? Um, and, you know, he was arrested alongside another person um, that had also been working there. And um, the reason why I bring up Martin Sostre um, and, and, his, uh, and, and that experience is because um, Martin went through a political transformation um, from having been in the nation of Islam um, and then turning to black nationalism and then while inside turned to anarchism. And what people uh, know today as black anarchism arguably emerges from Martin Sostre. A lot of folks may be more familiar with Lorenzo Camboa Irvin. Martin Sostre was his mentor. Um, and uh, the reason why I think it's in, it, that genealogy is important um, is because, for one, we, we tend to not well, for one, we, we are more familiar with, um, with the genealogy of classical anarchism, that being Kropotkin, Bakunin, Proudhon, uh, who the fuck else, Emma, uh, Emma Goldman, um, et cetera, right? But when we talk about um, black anarchism, it tends to be in a tokenized way, to be quite honest, uh, where we point to Ashanti Alston, then we point to Lorenzo Camboa Irvin, uh, and then we kind of, and then that, that serves as a, a recognition that they're black and that they're anarchists serves as a stand in for, let's say, anti racist politics or whatever, right? So um, I learned about Martin Soste through Lorenzo Camboa Urban, right? Um, you know, following him online and, and stuff like that. And the genealogy is important, um, or this history is important because um, Martin encountered anarchism through having uh, received support from anarchists internationally. Um, there was an international campaign that formed to, you know, free Martin Sostre. People are a lot more familiar with Free Huey as a defense campaign of the 60s, but there was also many other defense campaigns um, throughout uh, the 60s and 70s. And um, Martin Sostre's uh, case was one of those. Um, and I think that his struggle um, and uh, his contributions intellectually to, to anarchism um, are extremely important. And I think one uh, a thing that we have to like return to. Um, when I say that his struggle it itself was, you know, or the struggle around him, I think would more so be um, be accurate because um, the reason why I think it's important is because in having been framed up, right? And there's actually a documentary, if you want to go see it, it's called Frame Up. Um, focuses specifically on Martin Sostre. Um, his, the way that he handled his legal case, um, he knew that he was not going to get a fair trial. And so what he did was uh, use the court as a venue through which to educate those who were in attend, you know, support who were attending the actual um, the court sessions, right? And he was there, uh, you know, um, like challenging, like directly challenging the the judge, the lawyers, and all this, and laying out um, an analysis of colonial society, um, of the way in which, and this is actually pretty important. They tried to describe him as like uh, what the hell was it? Um, as paranoid, and so he challenged those things directly. Uh, asking, well, what exactly is paranoia? You know, um, how can how can this court recognize me as paranoid 
simply because these white doctors described me as such, right? And so it, it's interesting that he uh, challenged those uh, dynamics of racial domination um, because I think he was pretty attentive to the psychological aspects of um, colonialism, domination, etc. cetera. And uh, that's something that I personally believe is missing in, uh, in contemporary anarchism and, you know, anarchism more broadly, uh, attentiveness to the psychic aspects of domination. Um, and those weren't the only things that he had, you know, challenged at that time, right? The, the, the legitimacy of the police, uh, to even have uh, detained him and all this other stuff, right? Um, at the time, he, he cited a lot um, the Vietnam uh, movement that was occurring, so the anti-war movement, but also the actual struggle in Vietnam, right? And so what I think that, um, what I think that type of stuff points to is that um, this at the time that the trial was going on, he was not yet an anarchist, but was a black nationalist. And um, his turn to anarchism, I would argue, um, was, I think his turn to anarchism, he brought with him um, all the other previous um, influences and more specifically the anti-colonial uh, influences. And when it comes to uh, anarchist thought and the anarchist you know, historical tradition, uh, when it, uh, there's not much attention paid specifically to co uh, colonialism. There was this guy, um, his name was Camilo Berneri, and um, apparently he was an Italian internationalist that was involved in the Spanish Revolution um, and uh, was also reflecting on the um, Spanish Revolution. One of the arguments that he brought up was that in order for the Spanish Revolution to have won, or to win rather, because I think this was in the midst of it, uh, in order for that, yeah, this is 36, 37. Um, in order for that to have, uh, to win, uh, the Spanish Revolutionary Forces had to declare their support for Moroccan independence. And it wasn't like a, a, a simply like a, like a moralistic thing of like we need to show our support to you know um, to oppress peoples elsewhere type of thing. It was more so a recognition that the Spanish um, I don't know enough about the Spanish Revolution, but the reactionary forces, basically the state and reactionary forces, were using Morocco, their colonial base as the place from which to launch the counterattack against the movement. So um, that I think points to, it's, it's a thread that I haven't really seen picked up in many other places. And I only came across this because of a publication in Brazil uh, called Anti-Colonial Anarchism um, that we're working through trying to translate. And, you know, in that they uh, engage um, the topic of colonialism and anti-colonialism and what it might mean for anarchists and anarchist thought to incorporate more anti-colonial perspectives. Um, so I don't know, how am I on time? You have as much time as you want. Okay. Um, so yeah, the like the reason why I, I bring that up in relation to Sostre is because he had an anti-colonial and anti-imperialist perspective. Uh, while uh, again, people refer to Lorenzo Camboa Irvin and Ashanti Alston, I don't feel that there's enough engagement with actual black thought, with anti-colonial thought, with anti-racist thought, uh, abolitionism, etc. Right. So I think um, I think there's a challenge for us, you know, to to actually um, deepen our understandings of of these topics um, and to um, not simply incorporate those analyses and you know understandings, but deepen them. What does it mean today to uh, get, gain a better understanding of you know colonialism, 
um, and anti-colonial anti-colonialism today, right? Um, what does that mean in relation to Black people's autonomous struggles today? Um, and you know, if we do look at the way in which um, uh, Black anarchism has emerged since Sostre, um, he does call out directly, as a matter of fact, um, you know, uh, what he calls Uncle Tom's at that, you know, in, in that moment, those um, Black middle class professional people who threw him under the bus when he was being, you know, um, targeted and stuff like that. Um, this, in later anarchist thought, develops as an analysis of neocolonialism, right? Um, and uh, neocolonialism, new forms of colonialism, the ways in which uh, former or colonized subjects get incorporated into certain power structures, etc. So, um, you know, these, these understandings of colonialism and neocolonialism, um, I think, again, point us to a direction of how to deepen our thought and where to go um, in, in our understandings of, of how to get free today. Um, and I don't know, for the, for the sake of time and uh, coherence, um, I guess I'll end with a, a quote from the introduction to Martin Sostre in court. This was a zine that was produced by the uh, Martin Sostre Defense Committee in 67. It has recently been republished and recirculated um, by the Southern Chicago Anarchist Black Cross Zine Distro. Um, the intro was written by Lorenzo, and he was part of recovering this piece of text and getting it out there. Um, and the thing is that, you know, um, he wanted to bring this back into circulation so as to recognize the legacy of Martin Sostre and place a, you know, um, to give certain respect um, to uh, to that history, but also to lay out, you know, um, some ideas for for what contributed to his uh, conversion to anarchism, what, what contributed to his turn to anarchism, um, and what the tasks might be for Black and other anarchists of color today. Right. So here he's talking about, you know, how uh, while he was inside. Um, while Lorenzo Camboa was um, incarcerated, that's when he met um, Martin Sostre. Um, Camboa Irvin had been at that time uh, in prison for, I think it was like hijacking a plane from East Germany, going to Cuba because it was socialist, so he thought he was going to be good. Um, and uh, well, he got extradited um, and sent back or some shit. Um, so, you know, he's talking about his discussions with Martin Sostre and, uh, you know, the way in which Sostre was trying to impart on him some, uh, you know, some ideas about uh, libertarian socialism or anarchist socialism or whatever. And he says, the initial ideas for black autonomy within the overall anarchist movement came from these sessions. As a black Puerto Rican, Sostre felt alienated from his community. And since much of the analysis about black oppression and socialism was by right, white radicals, he had originally gravitated uh, into black nationalism. It was only later during his time in prison that he gravitated into anarchist socialism. He told me endlessly that socialism and anarchism were for all people, not just Europeans and well-to-do intellectuals. It was universal. At first, I had serious doubts about all this as it seemed to me just more white radical student ideology. They were not sympathetic to the black struggle and they were not working class or poor. Sostre's ideas, however, were that anarchists of color must build their own wing of the anarchist movement. He didn't call it a black autonomy, but that's what it was. Um, so, you know, I, I think what stands out to me about that is the last lines, right? Uh, that anarchists of color must build their own wing of the anarchist movement. Um, and I think, I think that's a task that we have to figure out, you know, what, you know, what that actually looks like, right? Um, I won't fully read the rest of the thing because I'll probably bore you all. But the other section that's relevant here is 
like Sostay has said, actually what he are, what he talks about a little after that is the ways in which we tend to think of, again, anarchism as a European thing, simply because it emerged from in the continental Europe and then amongst European migrants here. But what he argues is that each ethnicity and you know um, each group had its own character of anarchism, right? So Italians had their own forms of anarchism uh, in the U.S. when they moved here. Uh, Germans did as well. Uh, Jewish did as well, right? And so he argues that it should be no fucking surprise that uh, there is a thing as black anarchism that emerges. And you know, I think we. Uh, are at a point where we are now, where black anarchism has more circulation as an idea, but I think we still, again, have to deepen uh, what, what these things mean in practice. Like Sostre has said, we must manufacture our own anarchist of color school of thought and revolutionary practice. Nobody can truly speak for us and fight in our name. Black autonomy means independence of thought, culture, and action. We are not racial separatists, but we must be sure that we are strong enough to insist on our politics, leadership, and respect within any broader universal movement. We have been sold out, left out, betrayed, and tricked too many times by internal racism inside majority white coalitions and movements. Black voices matter. That is why I wrote a small pamphlet in 1972, Anarchism and the Black Revolution, while I was in prison in 79. So, you know, that, I guess that's, that's my thought. What, what does it, what will it mean or what will it take for us um, to actually build our own wing of the anarchist movement and to continue building our own independent uh, revolutionary movements to actually get free? Hello, uh, my name is Amber. I'm coming from uh, Miami and uh, currently in Champaign, Illinois. I wanted to touch a bit more on, I guess, the general subject of genealogy and uh, collective memory revisionism, um, but I guess using anecdotes uh, that I've personally experienced, um, particularly from the last six months to uh, a year that I've been uh, involved in particularly tenant organizing and also um, trying to develop my creative voice as a writer uh, for Red Voice News, particularly um, writing on behavioral economics and uh, how the 2008 financial crisis uh, affected a Black lives in particular. Um, a couple of days ago, we arrived in Chicago and the first thing we did when we got off the flight was uh, go see the Haymarket Affair uh, Memorial. Um, I believe it's in Forest Park. Uh, it's in a very nice cemetery, very clean. Uh, Nice statue. Uh, Emma Goldman also had her own bust. Someone left a condom. Uh, and near Emma Goldman were uh, about two dozen uh, revolutionaries, anarchists, persons who purported themselves to be revolutionaries. And uh, closer to the actual uh, Haymarket Affair a statue, but a very askew and to the right and very hidden was uh, Lucy Parsons' grave. Um, no flowers, a bare gravestone, uh, and it seemed as though it was the same type of gravestone used for the journalists and uh, the individuals that were closer to uh, Emma, Emma Goldman's uh, grave and bust um, that had been added at a later date. 
So it was very clear to me that not only was her gravestone an afterthought, but it was askew. It wasn't aligned correctly with the other gravestones. Um, it was nowhere near Albert Parsons' uh, name. It was nowhere that I personally could find the first couple times walking around the graveyard. And um, that experience really set in stone, so to speak, for me, uh, our lack of memory as anarchists and how a lot of the times we love to just go to the Haymarket Affair, you know, memorial and like look at the statue and feel good and take pictures, um, you know, and not even really give it a second thought and not really even thinking about uh, questions will probably be at the end. Thank you. That will be at the end. That will be at the end. Um, but I guess my main point being that it seems collectively as anarchists as though not only do we lack understanding of black issues, but we also uh, lack memory. And I feel as though that's a really uh, grave issue and uh, also kind of drives home the point that separatism is valid and uh, creating our own institutions and our own organizations and our own structures is unfortunately, in most cases, very much needed for Black revolutionaries and more specifically for Black anarchists. Um, because when we just put them all together, it just seems like the Black person's always askew and to the side and dead like everyone else, but given less respect, um, we don't honor them in the same way. Um, I guess I primarily wanted to uh, talk about Black genocide uh, in the context of Miami, uh, the city in which I currently live. Uh, so 37% of Black people in Miami have zero net worth. Um, and this is more than the 15% of Black people in Miami who are unemployed. Um, and the median income necessary to own a home in Miami is $71,000. Meanwhile, the median um, Black income is 21212 um, So, uh, being very much aware of those realities, being very much in touch with them, I've chosen to dedicate a lot of my time to uh, tenant organizing. Um, I live in the historic neighborhood of Overtown um, that has been left in a state of decay. However, um, a lot of our current tenant efforts are in another area known as Brownsville, which is right off the train station. Um, and about a 15 minute drive away. Uh, every time we've had a public meeting uh, for the tenants union, uh, there has also been an accompanying shooting same day, sometimes same hour uh, as the tenant union meeting. Um, and in a lot of cases, it tends to uh, scare those very individuals away from not only attending, but from even interacting with tenant organizers. And uh, more to that point, it's not, I feel uncomfortable even calling them comrades, but our white comrades uh, who go out and interact with these very communities often do so in ways that are counterproductive to building not only 
trust and relationships with said tenants, but empowering those very tenants. Um, an instance that comes to mind in particular, uh, and I really hope this isn't too specific for anyone in Miami listening, uh, but this is stuck in my mind for a couple months now. Um, we were, I don't even think we were canvassing that particular day. We were just like hanging out in the area, talking to people, um, walking around, really trying to get a lay of this particular complex as uh, not only had it been left in a state of disrepair, but it was exceedingly hazardous to the residents um, living in that complex. Uh, not only was there mold, but there'd been a fire, uh, an electrical fire that had just uh, kind of blown up an area and just was kind of left there with um, exposed wires and it just rained um, the night before. So there were puddles in that area. And uh, this is a low income subsidized housing. So there are a lot of children uh, live in this very complex. And uh, we were there, it was about five organizers and um, a visibly white female organizer um, interjected in a situation where uh, a black child was crying in a corner. And uh, she looked at the father of that child and she looked at the child and she didn't really think about what the situation may have been to lead to that situation and immediately went to this child and was like, hey, it's okay, what happened? Are they hurting you? What's going on? It turns out this child was 12 years old, bullying a three-year-old child and had pushed them into a puddle uh, near this electrical area and uh, had gone to cry to avoid discipline. And um, the father came over and fully ignored this organizer and went to speak to his son as any father would and told him that what he did was wrong and that he should know better by this point in his life. And if he didn't, then he needed to talk through his emotions because what he was doing was wrong. And I feel as though these biases prevalent in white organizers are more toxic to the community and more toxic to these relationships than even they realize and they could know. Because I have gone canvassing and I've interacted with this person since then. And a lot of the times when they're door knocking, a lot of people don't answer when they're at the door anymore in this particular building. And a lot of people weren't answering the door when they were knocking in the first place. Um, and it just makes everything a lot harder. And it, it seems to be not only a lack of self-awareness and a lack of, I don't even think it's a lack of self-crit, it's not really applying and practice the theory that you purport to be following. Um, and it's just turned out to be really difficult in tenant organizing because I believe, albeit this area is uh, we're 80 percent black, of the tenant organizers, uh, organizers, not tenants that we've worked with, only two of us are black and I am the only black woman in this organization. Um, furthermore, from that, uh, particularly politically, uh, we'll go to speak specifically to health issues and to mold and to contamination in these apartments. And these other organizers will feel bold enough, comfortable enough to 
walk in there in a color coordinated Bernie Sanders 2016 t-shirt with their $500 bike, curly blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, I understand that to be particularly specific, <laughs> but um, it's just, it's a very serious problem. And I feel like even within Black Rose day to day, I feel as though it goes exceedingly uh, unaddressed. I'm not going to speak to the uh, demographic makeup of our local apart from to say that, again, I am the only Black woman, I am the only Black person. And uh, although my comrades have been accommodating, accommodation isn't necessarily enough as it is not my role to educate you on your practices and on your biases every single day. That is not my role in the organization. That is not what I have choose to do with my time. And I don't believe that it is appropriate, um, particularly in a city where uh, nearly 20% of uh, residents in the city of Miami uh, are black. Uh, however, I will say 71% um, of uh, Miami is uh, Hispanic or Latinx. However, uh, in that number, it is unclear as to the ancestry of those people, um, indigenous, African, or otherwise. So it's been difficult uh, organizing around that and uh, finding ways to cope with the biases that affect the movements of everyone around you all the time. Uh, and then also perhaps through tokenization, perhaps because people just believe in me as an individual, feel the weight and the pressure of having to not necessarily do everything yourself, but being kind of the lone voice on a lot of uh, issues uh, or the lone person um, to represent myself. So I feel as though calling back to de-eurocentralizing uh, anarchism, calling back to uh, our genealogy as anarchists, I feel as though we look a lot at written history, we look a lot at that record. However, it needs to be noted that that record is exceedingly incomplete in not just uh, aspects of uh, Black liberation, but uh, earlier today we had a discussion on uh, disability justice and how integral uh, these communities are in struggles and how unfortunately a lot of the times it ends up that we are the torch bearers of these movements and then the authors of the pieces that our movements are based off of tend to be white. Um, another thing that I wanted to address uh, before we get to questions is um, my blackness. I view myself before my gender identity as black. You may not recognize me as my gender identity. However, based on how I look, you automatically recognize me as black. And I feel as though I come to you as flamboyantly as I am, hoping to be heard. <laughs> uh, because I feel as though 
when I enter spaces and don't present myself in a particular way, I am heard less or I am not heard at all. Um, and it really sucks. <laughs> so uh, those are just a few anecdotes. Um, hoping for a couple questions, comments from the audience, and we can move from there. Um, we had a couple things to plug at the end as well, so just wanted to leave some space open at the end. Um, so if we could, yeah, if we could get, um, if people are able to uh, line up, if they have questions or comments, um, because I feel as though if you just raise your hand and maybe you're further back, it would be more difficult to hear you than if we had sort of like a line of people, Comic-Con style, coming up and talking, so. Uh, just a logistical suggestion, there's a mic back right there. So another solution might be to uh, circulate that mic. The problem is that it's not wireless, but. Yeah, if people could uh, come up the ramp on the right side of the stage, uh, your right, my left, uh, and use the mic there, that would be appreciated. I think it looks pretty sturdy, ma'am. I hope it's sturdy. If it's not, I'll sue. I love noise. I'm actually going to be doing a drone set in a couple months that I'm pretty excited for. It's probably going to sound exactly like that. Uh, sir, on the Far left side of the second row, what was your comment earlier? I don't think it heard you. Uh, I was just going to point out that the drone that you're talking about is the one that I Testing. So, was, if I'm not mistaken, um, I believe for other graveyards, other grave sites, you can actually uh, raise, raise funds rather to uh, restore these sites, and particularly if they're run by the Illinois Historical Society, uh, then I definitely believe that is uh, a worthwhile campaign and uh, something that should be emphasized and pushed by any organized uh, Illinois activist. Yeah, I have a uh, response to that. Uh, how many anarchists I have in this room right now? How many anarchists do I have in this room right now? Raise your hands. What does the term direct action mean? Right, so that's a lousy excuse. Um, uh, like people can like always make uh, fix pit holes. I remember everyone uh, brags about those white kids in Portland fixing those uh, uh, potholes, right? But you can't like ten, you know, a grave with Lucy Parsons. So I don't, I don't get that. I'm sorry. Did you just? Ask uh, me? First of all, I don't really have a car because I'm a disfranchised black person who's dying of cancer. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, the thing is, look, even if even if that may be. Him okay, well, bye. Well, thank you. Wow. You prove everything. <laughs> just want to make a comment for the podcast. The gentleman who made the comment about the uh, Illinois Historical Society has just now gotten up with his wife, uh, who seemed very embarrassed and left the room. Uh, he also confronted one of our panelists and asked, How many roses did you leave at Lucy Parsons' grave? in response to uh, the objections to her treatment. The shit writes itself. Um, <laughs> oh, really? Wow. What I was going to say to him, and I'll say to all of y'all, is that even if the things that he was saying are true, uh, where's the writing? Yeah. Where is the reflection of the efforts to actually challenge that historical society? Uh, where are the efforts and proof that anarchists have attempted to, you know, change how Lucy Parsons' grave currently exists right now. Uh, to anybody who shares this thought. So uh, in the interest of time, um, what, what, is it okay if we take like one or two more questions? Or Whatever's needed. Yeah, that's fine. Let's, 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 uh, let's do two more questions uh, and then wrap up to the, just because of time issues. That was fast. I probably spoke too much. What? I probably spoke too much. Are you coming to the kickback? This morning I like an athlete here. And um, I said, no, I gotta go. It's time to go. Uh, and when I walked in, I thought, oh, I'm going to see all my comrades from this area hmm. here. And I haven't. And I don't know why. Um, I don't. So I feel like you know why. I don't I know why. Okay. <laughs> I've been a revolutionary for about 50 years. Okay, so I know a lot of things. And why is one of them. The other thing is that we're at war. Okay? Black folks are dying. The feds are dying. Muslims, they want it, you know, they're killing them internationally. So I'm sorry. I I wish Lucy Parsons was given, you know, but everybody in the workforce, everybody in the educate, you know, the educational system is Lucy Parsons. Absolutely. Put over here with a, a crude stone. So at this point, I think one of the things I wanted to say is Cerverto, is that your name? Cerverto? Servio. Servio. I really, I, I really like what you said because for me it's been a very long time. And at this point, like they said, I've been sick for a year. The only person I'm talking to on Facebook is Sarge. Okay. So, you know, I was you the one that that suggested France Fanon said Fanon in a study group a long time ago a week ago. Okay. So before that. Before that, colonialism, like you said, I can think about colonialism in the struggle in this country. Okay? I've been a revolutionary in New York. Um, it was a, a black, um, a Puerto Rican, and a communist came together and made a group called Bolshevik. And, you know, I, we didn't talk about colonialism, because like you said, that was a European thing. That was something over there. We talked about everything here. So, when I went to this reading group, it really, some of the things you said, it really opened up. It really just opened up a new, a new lane. Um, and I think that people have to see, and I said this at another meeting, and I think it's true that you have to see this is an international struggle. Everywhere Trump has been, there's been a, a step up of oppression, whether it was Israel, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, everywhere he's been. So that's one thing that we don't see this as an international struggle. We take small little issues and we fight to the death. And it ain't it don't mean nothing. It may it may be an injustice, it may be too bad, but it's not the fight. We don't have the luxury at this point in history, 
not to take on the struggle. They're, they're definitely organizing and have been for a long time. You know, their training, their weaponry, their everything, their training. A week that near me is stupid, okay? So I just think that that's one of the things I just want to say to a large crowd whenever I get in front of a large crowd, maybe. And um, the other thing is that we really have to look at colonialism. When, um, whenever the song is the final conflict, we may be coming up on the final conflict. And if we don't win, then humanity will no longer be on this planet. Because the inhumane things that are happening now, there's precedence being set. So I think that, I mean, to bicker about something like that little issue, give me a break. Kids are caged. Maybe for sex trafficking. You know, whole black community. When I was younger, you know, Friday night, we went downtown in Danville, and there were several bars and all kinds of folks in the, in the parking lot. Now you can't even buy people. <coughs> now, everybody says, oh, they moved away to better places, wherever that is. But no, they were incarcerated. They were killed. So no, we're at war, and it's serious. And so, you know, that's why I have to say. <laughs> I really love and appreciate everything you said. And uh, it's a war, and it's also a genocide. Uh, and it's a genocide. The war on drugs is a genocide. Uh, police are enforcing genocide. A lot of these state sanctioned structures are enforcing eugenics on the population. And I use Lucy Parsons' grave as an example that is emblematic of greater systematic issues. And I feel as though the gentleman who got up and left was actually upset because he understood what I meant in that in not recognizing history, you're also likely not recognizing the black revolutionaries and the black anarchists before you here today. And it was very clear to me that he had not heard anything that my two comrades had said or anything that I was saying as clear by his attempt to interject uh, earlier in the presentation and uh, getting up and leaving at the end. So I understand your point. I understand that this is tiny in the scale of things. Um, but it's just an example. No, yeah. I, and everything I said was anecdotal and everything I said was just an example of greater systematic issues that I felt were already addressed by the other presenters and it didn't need reiteration in the same way, in the same light. And I felt it interesting and important to use my experiences and my lens to craft it in a different light for you all. Um, because a lot of you I do not know, and I'm not sure what any of you would ever respond to. I don't have any marketing statistics on this room right now, so it's really difficult to know. So you try everything. Um, and I, I try to try everything. Um. Out of the interest of time, I'm just not going to comment on that. Um, I have a lot to say, but I would like to hear from at least one more person, if we have time. Yeah, let's let's hear from one more person, and then I know Sergio um, has uh, some something important to uh, announce as well before that. So if there's one last question, and then we'll, we'll hear from any panelists uh, comments on that, and then we'll hear from uh, Sergio's announcement. If, if there's a last question, then you can make it up to here, please. No, I was going to say that that was amazing. Yeah. I mean, I forgot that for a minute that we had someone talking about a literal revolution because the rest of the panel was so good. So I just. Um, so this is. Okay. 
Um, what? This isn't a question, it's just a comment and a, a great gratitude to all of you for giving us both historical um, knowledge that many of us, I'm sure, didn't have prior to this um, and connecting it. Um, thank you, um, Amber, for connecting this to the present day and adding to that history, which I think is incredibly important. So I really appreciate you getting to the specifics of your personal life and what you see because this is creating record keeping, right? This is creating history. So thank you very much to all of us. Yeah, so the last thing I'll say, I guess, um, I guess I won't respond to that, but uh, the one thing I do want to announce is that um, there's an ongoing fundraiser right now for Lorenzo Cambello Irvin. Um, it's uh, a call for support because actually he makes many great points, but one of the things is that for these people that we hold up as contemporary black anarchists and or contemporary, you know, uh, or surviving political prisoners, we have to really like recognize what that fucking means for aging revolutionaries. What that means is that they use, or they use their time in their, you know, um, in their youth, in their, you know, prime adulthood, engaging in things that later on in life won't give them a pension. You know, and so when it comes to survival um, of, you know, our elders, uh, it's really important for us to show up um, and, you know, and well support. So he has an ongoing fundraiser uh, to support his living and healthcare expenses. Um, I wish I could give you like a short link, but it's on GoFundMe. So I don't know exactly how to do this. If you have cash, uh, we can probably circulate a bucket, take account of that and then deposit it or something. Um, you can go to Google uh, to search this thing. I can give you the URL now. It's gofundme.com slash support for Lorenzo Camboa Urban. Really simple. I'm quite sure y'all can remember. Um, y well, we can, yes, we can post it. Uh, we can post it on any public thing. Um, if you have cash, um, contribute there. We'll take stock and... Uh, you could also check our Black Rose uh, Facebook page and Instagram, um, and we'll we'll shoot it up uh, later tonight so that people can access it. Um, and actually, I would I opened up the link, and I think there's a quote here um, that is really relevant in general. Judge your friends by those who support and love you. Judge your comrades by those who would fight for common ideals and suffer slash die with you. So. So uh, let's have one last big hand for Mohammed, uh, Marvin, Servio, and, and Amber. Yeah.